Hey guys, Quiv the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to part 4 of starting astrophotography for lazy people. So today, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about uh, your actual OTA, optical tube assembly, along with your camera, how you can choose them and how to choose them wisely. Um, so we've already talked last week about field of view and uh, sampling uh, in broad details. Uh, so just as a reminder, uh, based on your camera sensor size and your telescope focal length, you can determine the field of view of your camera. Based on the pixel side, you can pixel size and the focal length, you, you can determine the resolution of your camera and you want your camera resolution to be at least uh, twice as big or twice better than the smallest amount of detail that you can capture and actually because your pixels are square you'd even want them three times better so like your resolution when you when you look at it um, if you want to capture uh, details that are three arc seconds uh, wide you would want your resolution to be one arc second per, per pixel because stars are round pixels are um, are square, so you cannot use directly a divide by two, which is from the Nyquist uh, sampling theorem, whatever it's called in English. Um, so that's with the, the importance of the field of view and how the, the camera and the telescope are related. Now, before I go into choosing a, t a camera and telescope and what you should be looking at, I'll go first to our overriding principle, which is being lazy. We want to be lazy in the end, which means that on the camera side, there's one thing that you want to make sure of if you want to be lazy is to make sure that the camera is cooled and you can choose the temperature that you want to cool it to, uh, which is typically the case with those CMOS cameras from like QHY or from um, uh, ZWO. There are some cameras that say they have a fan and they're cooled, but it's not true cooling in that they're just like air cooling kind of thing. It, you, it, you cannot put the sensor to a specific temperature. So always double check that. Can you actually put the sensor to a specific temperature that is far lower than the current ambient temperature? The reason you want this is that uh, your, your camera is affected by dark current and uh, dark current increases with the temperature of the sen sensor and it increases a lot i have another video about that if you're interested i am pointing it to it uh, right now and um so that's one thing so that means that this dark current is actually a source of noise and uh the higher it is the more noise it generates and so ideally you want something that's cooled for that another big advantage of cooled cameras is that in the end you're taking uh target frames of your target, but you're also taking what is called calibration frames to remove the average of that dark current uh, from the image, roughly. And to take calibration frames, you need to take them at the same temperature as the frames that you took off your target. Uh, if, you have, if you want more details about that, I also have a video on that, which I'm linking to above. Um, but if you don't have a cooled camera where you can set the, the, the temperature of the sensor, the target temperature of the sensor, then you cannot take those dark frames easily. With this, I can set the temperature of the sensor, which means that any time I want, uh, I can just like cool the camera to that temperature um, if it's not too hot outside, and, and then just take my dark frames with the dust cap on. Easy. So that's a big thing for the cameras. If you want to be lazy, we want a cold camera. Seriously. Uh, DSLRs can be awesome. There's the EOS RA for astronomy that came out, which is great, but it's not cooled. So for me, it disqualifies it for lazy astrophotography. Um, so that's for the camera. That's the overriding principle to be lazy on the camera. I will add also, you probably don't want a big sensor uh, to start with, uh, simply because it comes with a lot of difficult things with it and that could you know also remove a bit from the laziness aspect um, but i'll get to back to that then we have the telescope the telescope itself we want to be lazy how do we want to be lazy with the telescope well we want to make sure it's not something that we'll have to adjust regularly and by and large most telescopes with mirrors like this one are like schmidt cassegrain's telescope which i showed in the first episode of this series they need to be adjusted. They need to have something called collimation, which is basically aligning the mirrors together. And, you know, some of those telescopes will hold collimation very well, others won't, and then they need to be readjusted from time to time. This one is a very special telescope. It's a Vixen R200SS, um, which, in theory, doesn't require collimation. It's pre calibrated at factory, and it's built in such a way that it doesn't require uh, recollimation. Recal so that's the only reason I have it 
plus another one that I'll go in a moment to in a moment. But that basically means that uh, telescopes like um, this one or like uh, the Edge HD uh, series of telescope by Celestron, which are very popular for astrophotography, they're mirror-based schmidt cassegrain telescopes, are their RASA 8 or RASA 11 telescopes, uh, which are specialized for us for very fast astrophotography. You'll have some adjustments to make, although for the RASA telescopes, I cannot say much. Uh, the RASA telescopes, one of the problems they'll have is back focus and I'll go to that in a moment as well and it's it becomes a bit more difficult to do monochrome astrophotography uh, based on filters because it, you can't really put a filter wheel on those uh, RASA telescopes that's why I would not recommend them to start astrophotography as you know a lazy person uh, if you're experienced and you know how to be lazy with the RASA 8 by all means go for it but as a starting yeah maybe not so in that case, yeah, like, okay, uh, if mirror telescopes are not good, and it's, it's a bit of a, a hit in the stomach there because uh, this kind of telescope, Newtonian telescopes, can be very cheap and have a very fast focal ratio. Remember focal ratio? That's important too. The lower it is, the faster your telescope is, the less you need to expose to get the same results. So it's important. This one is f3.8, which is quite low. Um, so... That's why I really like it. It has a fast focal ratio, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't need manual adjustments. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, but in terms of the, the ruling class of telescopes for beginner in astrophotography, we have the refractors. And the refractors, they're basically you know, camera lenses that have been um, modified to uh, be very good at infinity focus, so in focus towards the stars. And you know, s there are tons of refractors that are available. They come in multiple classes the only thing you want to make sure of is that you take a refract if you go for a refractor which I actually recommend you go to you go towards a refractor that has at, le at least a doublet or a triplet uh, lens design and that's the the reason is that refractors which are made of lenses at the front of the um, of the the, the the telescope assembly here we have just mirrors no lenses well we have a lens in the focuser there but it's a different lens uh, you have lenses here at the front and they don't focus um, light at the same spot depending on the color of that light so red and blue don't focus in exactly the same spot if you have a single lens but doublets and triplet refractors kind of like make that problem go away um, so that's one thing uh, in terms of the type of telescopes that you'd be looking at to be lazy uh, so to be lazy i would recommend at least for starters uh, in astrophotography a refractor or maybe a Newtonian like this one that is guaranteed to not need further you know messing around with now on top of that one of the things you really want to get is a telescope that supports this little red box here um, this little red box is the focuser it's an electronic focuser that is controlled via USB and you want to make sure that you can attach your um, you, you can attach a focuser to your telescope if you cannot attach a focuser to your telescope, you're not going to be lazy. Well, you can be lazy, but you'll get worse results. Uh, the reason being that throughout the night, the temperature changes, as I mentioned, I think, in a previous uh, video, and you are going to have your focus kind of shift. So you'll get stars that are out of focus. It doesn't look good. You'll throw away a lot of frames, and that's not being lazy, is it? So you want to be able to refocus throughout the night, and for that, a focuser is a must-have. An electronic focuser is a must-have. So you'd want to double-check with whatever shop that you're shopping from that you can attach a focuser to that telescope, like the ZWEF focuser, which I have. It's taken a lot of flack on my channel, but it's not that bad, really. Uh, for the price, it's, it's pretty decent. Um, or you could have yeah, the Sesto Senso uh, focusers, which I've heard good things from about. And you, know, you have like the Focus Cube, Pig Pegasus, I think, Focus Cubes. I, I never remember. You have tons of brands, and the, the, the top ones are Optech and Moonlight. Those are like the Rolls-Royce uh, focusers, and the price reflects that. Um, so you want to make sure that you can attach there. There's Rigel systems as well. And there's tons of focusers around. You can also make it make your own with an Arduino uh, board, but that's something else. So being able to attach a focuser is very important. Um, another possibility to be lazy, by the way, is to use a camera lens. Camera lenses are actually great for starting astrophotography. Some of the best 
results that I've seen, I've taken myself, are with camera lenses. In particular, a Canon 200mm f2.8 lens, uh, closed down to like f3. Point something, or um, even this little plastic fantastic lens, which is 50 millimeters uh, f1.8 can give good wide field results. Uh, although wide field is a bit more difficult in light posed areas, I'll get back to that as well. And we have uh, you know, lenses like 300 millimeters f4, which are not prohibitively expensive, especially compared to triplet refractor refractors of uh, the same size. So, uh, and cameras, if they're from, uh, camera lenses, if they're from Canon, you can use the Astro Mechanics adapter, which I have uh, reviewed in another video, which I'm linking to right now, to actually control the focus ring on the camera. So you don't need to attach any focuser on the lens itself. You can just control the lens focusing ring and, you know, you can focus throughout the night using that adapter. It simplifies a lot uh, the process. The disadvantage of camera lenses is that they'll typically have less image quality at infinity compared to refractors and also they have a very limited amount of back focus uh, to the camera sensor. Um, and I'll get back to that again. A lot of telescopes you'll see a back focus of 55 millimeters, which is the distance between the focuser and the camera sensor. And you want to respect that to get good star shapes. Uh, but that means that the lower your back focus is, the less accessories like filter wheels or what we call off-axis guiders you can put in there. Uh, so cameras, they're very bad at that. Although with this particular adapter and my ZW camera, I'm actually able to put a filter wheel in between my uh, lens and my camera without any problem. So which is which is great. That's why, like, if I were to start from scratch again right now, I'd buy a 200 millimeters f 2.8 lens uh, cheap, like you know used. Uh, there's tons of those as long as the focus ring works. And I'd buy a cooled camera from ZW, maybe one shot color like the 533 MC Pro and or the 183 mc pro uh, or even the 183 mm pro monochrome camera with a filter wheel and i just start imaging because it is so easy and uh this almost like it's almost like a out of the box kind of solution um so that's like for being lazy part being lazy there's one more thing about being lazy is you want to be able to attach a guide scope easily uh, and a guide camera easily to your setup. Uh, you might remember from the previous video, um, guiding is important. It basically is a feedback loop between a secondary telescope and camera, this thing here, and the mount. And this thing is made to just track a star. It doesn't image that star. Well, it does, but it doesn't s it's not used to actually you know, create the final image. It just keeps track of that star and it sends commands to the mount to tell it like, hey, you're deviating, you should go this direction or that direction. So very uh, important to be able to attach a guide scope. And so you may want to ask like, how do I, do I attach a guide scope to that particular refractor or to that particular telescope? How does it work? You know, to make sure that you can have that. So you, you need to be lazy, to be able to attach a focuser to the telescope, you need a telescope that doesn't need constant manipulation and adjustments, um, and you need a telescope where you can add a guide scope very easily. Now, I'm not going to go too much into OAGs or off-axis guiders. They're usually reserved for like higher focal length telescopes, and especially for telescopes with big mirrors that can move, like schmidt cassegrains And those, you, you actually it's better to have an OAG and I will not go into the details because I do not recommend that to, for starting astrophotography. And if you are already at a level where you can go towards one of those telescopes, you probably already know everything about OAGs. So, and on the camera side, we want it cooled. That's pretty much it. Now, before we go further, I want to talk a bit about uh, the um, Astronomy Tools website that I showed earlier. So I'm on that uh, tool again. And one of the things that's also available is if you go to calculators, you have CCD suitability. And that's pretty nice because um, we have a very good explanation about you know why you need a, a pixel resolution that is roughly three times better than the amount of detail that you can capture at the top. And uh, at the bottom you have the ability to put in your telescope, your camera, and then it will tell you if your pixel size is okay for typical seeing. And um, I would actually recommend typically, at least for my seeing in Tokyo, I've seen that one arc second per pixel is pretty good. 
that's pretty much it. And this is this system is pretty much one arc pixel per second, which is good. You can go above that very easily uh, because you know it's uh, you will be under sampling your pictures, but you can recover that with dithering and drizzling, which I'll go in into a much later video, I assume. Um, otherwise you can you know uh go even deeper you can go to like 0 0.5 arc seconds per pixel but then you need a great mount you need great seeing you need great everything there's tons of factors get, that can affect you know how much detail you can get so there's no need especially when you're starting to shoot for super precision on the objects a lot of the most amazing objects are huge nebulae for example and uh you can get by without providing any de details on those nebulae. So one more thing to uh, keep track of. And so you can use that to input your scope and camera par parameters and see you know, what your res resolution is and whether it is fine for typical seeing. And you can, uh, you know, you can change that. You can uh, use this along with the FOV, field of view calculator, to always find, like when you're looking at a camera and a telescope, whether they're well matched together. That way you can really always keep track of both at once. Now I mentioned that I would recommend uh, a cold camera and I would recommend a refractor to start with, or even a camera lens. Uh, so what would you look at when you're looking at refractors bef besides the lazy parameters that are already talked about. Well, let's look at a particular telescope, which I've like wanted to get ever since the original version of that by William Optics uh, was released. It's, uh, it was originally the William Optics Star 71, which is still sold right now. And uh, for example, um, Telescope Express or Telescope Service, uh, which is a firm in Germany selling tons of stuff about telescopes, sells its own version called the TSQ 71 ED. Um, and so what do you want to look at when you're checking the telescope? Well, the first thing is the focal ratio. And uh, for a refractor, no, the first thing will actually be the number of lenses, whether it's a doublet or a triplet. You can get by with a doublet. A triplet is ideal. And then here we have a quadruplet. And that's because within the telescope, there's not only the three lenses at the front, there's another lens that flattens the field of view. And if you have a doublet or a triplet, you'll actually need to buy an additional accessory called uh, the field flattener slash reducer, or maybe just a field flattener, uh, so that you can actually illuminate the whole sensor of the camera in a good way. And uh, so that's the first thing to check. And I would recommend a triplet if you can afford it, but I've had very good results with a doublet. Um, then, uh, it was this one. The advantage is that you don't need to buy anything. And in addition to the scopes, you don't need a field flattener reducer. Um, you, you can just use it as is. And let's look at this. We saw there's the focal ratio. That's important. The smaller, the better. And here it is actually very decently small for uh, a telescope like this one. So um, refractors that are doublets or triplets will typically have a focal ratio that's around like f6. Um, and then you add a, 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 or even F7, and then you add a reducer, uh, which basically diminish, diminishes the focal length. So if you diminish the focal length without changing the aperture, you get a better focal ratio because you're zooming in less. And just as I explained in the last video, you get more light per pixel. Um, and so uh, in that case, you know, F, uh, F6, F7 with a reducer becomes like F5 point something or F6 point something respectively. Uh, this F4.9 is actually quite fast for a refractor. Um, and so this, this is what like one of the main, uh, you know, things that attract me to this little scope. And if we look at uh, the technical data in there, we can see the focal length as well, which is quite important because it tells me how much of a field of view I'll have together with my camera. And uh, it tells me about the optics. It tells me about like the glass and stuff like that. One of the other important things it tells me about is uh, that it has a 45 millimeters fully corrected and illuminated field. This is a circle of 45 millimeters in di diameter in which you can actually put a sensor. If your sensor is bigger than that sensor, than that circle anywhere, it cannot be used for this telescope or it should not be used. And that circle is kind of subjective. The manufacturer of the telescope actually sets it. So um, it's, it might be a bit overestimated. And anyway, I would recommend to start with smaller sensors because smaller sensors lead to uh, smaller 
filters if you need filters, which leads to less money used, and uh, smaller uh, sensors will need, need lead to less vignetting, less pain while processing, especially if you're, you, you're in light polluted areas, the wider field you have, the more gradients you can have from the light pollution. And let me tell you, tell, tell you I'm intimately familiar with light pollution here in Tokyo. Um, so it's not that important as long as you can see that the field of illumination that's fully created, co corrected is big enough. And then we have uh, the focuser itself is important. You can see uh, what the connector to the focuser is. And that's something you will want to check with this, the, 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 the shop that sells you that telescope. Like, is how will I connect my telescope to my camera? Right, so I would advise you tell them what camera you've chosen, kind of and you are what camera you want to choose, what telescope you want to choose, and you ask them, how do I connect those two? Uh, because you have the, uh, here it's an M48 connector, which is great because you can put a two inch filter in there and then you can downsize that to M42 and then you can connect to the filter wheel from ZWO and then you can connect to the ZWO camera. Uh, QHY has a different philosophy about connecting their cameras, so it's a bit different and I don't know how it works. So, you know, it's uh, something that adds complexity. It depends on the manufacturer, it depends on the accessories that you have, it depends on the camera. Uh, so that's something to check with the shop ahead of time. And then, so, but also like you want to check whether the focuser can support an electronic focuser on top. Especially if you have a certain model in mind, you might, might want to Google that. I use Cloudy Nights, for example, a forum about astrophotography to check on that. And another thing you'll want to be checking is um, the back focus. So back focus is that thing I mentioned, like for this one is 55 millimeters. For Canon lenses here, it's 44 millimeters. Uh, typically, the longer the better because you have more space for accessories. But I have to say 55 millimeters, especially if you're using a refractor, you, you're not going to use a lot of accessories between your focuser and your camera lens. So 55 millimeters is fine. And I even told you already that for a camera lens, 44 millimeters is perfectly fine. And um, here we have a specific type of telescope uh, which, which is called a Petzval telescope, if I remember correctly, in that there is not a set back focus distance, distance that you, can, you need to, uh, to actually respect exactly. And your filters actually also affect the back focus distance. So back focus distance is a topic in and of itself, which I'll go to in, a, in another video. Um, and here we can see that it's the maximum working distance is 66 millimeters for the M48 thread. So that means I have 66 millimeters to uh, play with and I can have less, I can put my, let my sensor closer to the focuser than that. So it gives me a lot of freedom and I don't have to mess around during this setup uh, with that. Um, most of them will give you a specific number and you need to respect that down to the, to the millimeter. So something to keep in mind while you're choosing your telescope. Um, honestly, if I were uh, starting from scratch, I would choose this telescope or one of its clones. There's tons of similar telescopes from different brands, or I would go for just a camera lens with the Astro Mechanics adapter, um, because that's very cheap and it's very easy to control. Um, okay, so uh, that's kind of it for uh, the, uh, the refractor. Of course, there's also like checking whether you can attach a guide scope or how you will attach a guide scope to it. You want to ask the shop about that as well. And uh, there's also the dovetail, that, that black part at the top here, which is how you're gonna attach the telescope to your mount. Uh, some mounts, most mounts support Vixen mounting, Vixen style dovetails, and most refractors have a Vixen style dovetails. Some uh, bigger refractors are many bigger uh, schmidt cassegrain telescopes have a Los Mandy type uh, dovetail, uh, and you need to make sure that your the mount that you're going to use is going to support that Los Mandy type dovetail. So it can get uh, complicated there as well. But that's also like this compati compatibility with be between the different elements in your setup. You need to double check with the shop that you are buying from. Uh, now this telescope, because it's that Petzval design, it's fairly complicated. There's another uh, telescope that's very popular these days. It's called the Red Cat. Uh, so the Red Cat 51 from uh, William Optics, I have to hand it to them. Their, their marketing and the, the design and everything about it makes me want to drool on it and just buy it. Uh, but that, um, that Red Cat is 
pretty expensive it's very popular but you can see that it has a camera lens type of focuser so you turn it and attaching an electronic focuser to that is actually pretty complicated you need a belt focuser and the belt focuser it can slip um, and it gets a bit more complicated once the setup is done it's fine but I would not recommend it, recommend such a focuser to start with and if you're going to go for such a telescope you know I'd rather go with a similar uh, lens that would be a 200 millimeter Canon lens with the Astro Mechanics adapter it's gonna be cheaper too and uh, it's more integrated so something to keep in mind uh, so we're, we're talking about a lot of things and we've looked at uh, the telescope itself and one of the things with the telescope that I'd be looking at is of course the focal length. I already mentioned the resolution which is linked to the focal length and that I would take the resolution up to one arc second per pixel personally to avoid having too much head, too many headaches with the mount and the guiding itself. Um, I would even take less and I think like two arc seconds per pixel is perfectly fine and you'll see that with most refractors plus cameras cooled cameras that you can get you'll see that you'll be around two three arc seconds per pixel and it's fine so uh, if I look at a refractor I typically wouldn't go more than like 600 700 millimeters of focal lengths to be fairly honest and you can see that uh, the focal length for that earlier telescope I showed was around seven, uh, sorry, 347 millimeters, something like that, which is perfectly decent. You can get so much done with such a refractor. It's, abs it's a lot of fun. Okay, and uh, now that we've talked about the telescope side of things, let's talk about the camera side of things. So the camera side of things, it will look something like it will look like something like this, and this is from ZWO. I use ZWO because they're easy to connect to my telescope. Uh, QHY, I couldn't understand their principle, and I was too lazy to ask the shop, so I didn't use them. But that's the only reason. Uh, in for all intents and purposes, uh, they are probably the same. Uh, it's kind of like, do you like red or do you like blue, uh, kind of thing. So it's. Uh, uh, that's the reason why I would look at, uh, at uh, this page. And what you want to look at is the size of the sensor that you can see here, which, is, uh, how big, which will determine together with the focal length how big of a field of view you will have. And I recommend sensors that are fairly small. Micro four third size, one inch size, or up to APS-C size. You will see that on the, the specs sheet there is fine. APS-C becomes a bit difficult, to be honest, uh, especially if you're starting up. So Micro Four Thirds is my ideal compromise. This one, which is this camera here, is one inch. Uh, this one is Micro Four Thirds. Another thing you want to look at is, uh, I will not go into the big details yet, but the pixel size. Uh, 3.76 micrometers that's something you can put into uh, astronomy tools and it is something that you uh, you need to consider because together with the focal length it determines your resolution and so you, you want to double check that in astronomy.tools uh, website okay and then there's all sorts of stuff you'll want to look at the reviews on forums about cameras this camera in part like many cameras have a big amount of amp glow like that amp glow is something that that you can deal with but it's not awesome it's something that you'd want to avoid having to deal with at all if possible this camera here does not have any amp glow this camera here has a little bit of amp glow uh, but it's very manageable um, and you'll want to have a look at those charts uh, actually if you want to know more about this I have a great video on that uh, that explains everything about those charts from the beginning so feel free to click on it uh, there uh, but basically that's that's what I would look at and uh, for me uh, for a color camera the 533 MC Pro is great I have a, a review of that camera that I'm linking to up there as well I really enjoy this camera for a one-shot color camera and then there is uh, monochrome cameras and I really enjoy the 1600 mm cool or mm pro these days uh, which I would also recommend it has the micro four thirds sensor there is uh, one more thing about cameras and this is a big decision it is whether you go monochrome or one shot color and cliffhanger uh, that's something I don't want to get into right now because it's a big debate. Uh, there's a lot of things that monochrome versus uh, one-shot color 
effect. So we'll uh, look at that in the next video. So make sure to subscribe and to click on that notification icon to make sure you get that uh, new video when it comes out. And uh, you know, please like this video if you like it, liked it. Leave a co comment down below if you have remarks, suggestions, um, you don't agree with what I'm saying. Uh, and you know, I, I can I read the comments and I often integrate the feedback into my further videos. So that's something. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget to look up at the stars whenever you can, and I'll see you next time.